Over the past few days, news reports have emerged with the brutal treatment of migrants from sub-Saharan African countries in Tunisia. Now, this culminated in the expulsion of a number of migrants from the country into the borderlands between Tunisia and Libya, into parched desert territory where the migrants really struggled. There were lots of reports of very intense human rights violations by armed forces. But this is not an isolated incident. In fact, the trend of violence as well as racist behavior towards migrants has been building up for months. So to talk more about this, we have with us Fadil Reza, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of Meshkal, a media platform. Fadil, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Right, Fadil, so maybe let's start with the immediate uh, aspect. But before that, also go to February, where I believe President Kaya Saeed made some very uh, disparaging and almost violent remarks, where he said that the migrants who had come to Tunisia from sub-Saharan African countries were part of some demographic change project, he seemed to imply. And this is very familiar dog whistle politics across the world. And reports say that since then, there has been an uptick in incidents of violence against migrants from many of these countries. So maybe could you, could you first take us through the past few months and the kind of incident that what led to the incidents in the uh, city of Safax? Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the February speech by President Kai Syed was, um, uh, he was actually uh, uh, mirroring some of the rhetoric we've seen from European politicians of uh, this sort of great replacement theory. So uh, the, the idea was implying that, uh, in fact, uh, foreign funded NGOs had this uh, uh, conspiracy to, to bring uh, uh, black migrants from other parts of Africa to change Tunisia's demography from one that is uh, uh, African to uh, from one that is Arab to one that is more African, and uh, this is this is purely not true because there's actually very few uh, uh, migrants, you know, as a percentage uh, from other African countries. Some of them are students. Many of them had come for to study in Tunisia. Many of them are, are just there waiting until they can make the trip to, to Europe. A lot of them are, are, are just passing through Tunisia, are not settling in Tunisia. Uh, but nonetheless, this rhetoric really um, saw a spike, a real spike in violence. We saw, um, in fact, authorities had, had even said that they would, um, they would go after Tunisians who were uh, renting their homes uh, to to black migrants who are quote unquote illeg illegally, but of course it's it's very difficult, almost impossible to get a, um, a residence permit or to, to be there legally in Tunisia because the, the processes are, are, are made so difficult. Um, and as a result of that, you had people uh, kicking uh, migrants out of their homes. We saw a lot of them ending up in the streets, uh, camping out in front of the international uh, organizations, UN organizations like the IOM, the uh, UN uh, Refugee Council. Um, and in fact, uh, we didn't see a lot of help from, from those either. So th these were people who really seemed to be abandoned by everyone even their own governments, uh, many of their, their own governments, um, you know, did, did, uh, were unable to or, or, or did not uh, uh, manage to do uh, enough in terms of repatriation. Um, you know, there were some Tunisians who, 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 who protested at the time. There was quite a large protest in the capital of Tunis. There have been some uh, organizations to try and help uh, migrants who've been kicked out, left on the streets, uh, really lacking in food and shelter. Um, but at the same time, particularly in the city of Sfax, we saw things getting much worse because really a... Uh, um, a central point in the uh, path towards Europe. Uh, this is where a lot of the, 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 the boat making is uh, uh, to, to, to make the boats to go across the Mediterranean. Um, and we've started to see increasing mob violence, really, from, from, from Tunisians who are blaming migrants after this, this speech, really, that, that was, you know, basically gave uh, a green light to some of the violence uh, where they've seen, you know, the Tunisians have said that they, they think that, it, uh, that these migrants pose a security threat, um, that they, 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 they really uh, uh, adhere to this uh, conspiracy theory, this racist conspiracy theory that the president espoused. Um, and, and so in May, there was actually a, a migrant who was killed uh, from Benin in Sfax. Um, and then uh, uh, just a, 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 a couple of weeks ago, or less than, less than a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a Tunisian man who was killed in clashes with migrants. So this is really where we've seen the confrontations escalate uh, when we've gotten to this moment today. Right. Uh, Fadil, before we talk to you about Kaya Saeed and his policies before and how, you know, he sort of, uh, Tunisia in some ways ground to a halt in various ways, especially economically, ever since he's conducted his coup. So what, in some senses, prompted this kind of a, such a racist speech targeting what is clearly a very vulnerable population, like you said. It's not that it's one, a small population, and also quite uh, economically not necessarily the most well-off. So why was this a speech targeted at these migrants? 
Well, there's speculation that this is tied to, to the to deteriorating economic situation in Tunisia, the fact that we're seeing uh, increasing shortages uh, of uh, certain goods in uh, supermarkets um, that are really uh, um, a result of the fact that Tunisia has been cut off from international financial markets. Uh, their credit uh, uh, ratings have been uh, uh, lowered by uh, credit ratings agencies. Uh, as a result of that, it's become much more difficult to, to import uh, goods. Unfortunately, Tunisia is dependent on uh, basic goods, including um, uh, wheat, you know, very strategic food stuff. Um, but even other things like we've seen shortages of government subsidized uh, uh, cooking oil, for example, um, uh, sugar, um, coffee. So basic goods that people people need in their everyday lives have have, have seen shortages. Um, and, uh, you know, President Kai Sai had come in with these promises of, of, of really um, having, a, a, you know, sort of fixing some of the economic problems that had been uh, uh, fostered under under what was really a sort of a, a, um, the last 10 years where neoliberal policies were, were, were really enacted. Um, and in fact, uh, 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 things have, have, have gotten worse as, as there's really been a, a squeeze on, on Tunisia. There's a, an IMF loan that the, uh, they've been negotiating, it's been going back and forth. Uh, there have been certain conditions for this, including austerity policies, in increased austerity policies. The president, in terms of rhetoric, has, has seemed to reject these, uh, but that doesn't solve the, the underlying sort of uh, 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 economic crisis or even um, uh, the financial uh, challenges that Tunisia is going through. Um, and so, so these are certainly playing into the fact that, uh, uh, you know, people are seeing um, you know, uh, their livelihoods become more expensive, inflation is going up. Uh, uh, and and now when you have rhetoric sort of blaming uh, this other who is in Tunisia, then we do see, that unfortunately, some of this uh, uh, violence uh, uh, filtering out to, 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 to basically these vulnerable migrants who are in Tunisia. At the same time, uh, the President Kai Said has really been trying to, 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 to get better terms, it seems, from the IMF. Uh, and so he's been having uh, developing relations with uh, closer relations with the Italian far right prime minister, Giorgio Meloni, who actually made uh, several visits now to, to or at least uh, two visits very recently to Tunisia. And she came with the, the president of the EU Commission and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, offering more money, but very specifically uh, 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 talking about migration and using Tunisia to control migration within its borders. Uh, and we've also seen uh, the EU through a special fund uh, uh, giving hundreds of millions of euros per year to control migration within Tunisia. So, in fact, uh, Tunisian authorities are, are really controlling uh, migration within its own borders. And fortunately, with a lot of violence, uh, that seems to be in, in many ways what people have said is an extension of EU's uh, borders and border control uh, uh, in Tunisia. Right. So in this context, that, that was the next question I wanted to ask you, because I think 100 million was specifically assigned for border control when the EU leaders visited. But how does this sort of tie in with how Tunisia has been treating the question of migration itself? We know that recently there have been a couple of incidents of uh, boats in which migrants were traveling. They sank, a number of people died. And there were also reports in many of these cases that Tunisian authorities had actually not helped the migrants at all. In fact, removed the engines from some of the boats. That's what some of the NGOs were saying. So what has Tunisia's record in general been when dealing with migrants, for instance, who are looking to go towards Europe. Yeah, yeah, and and, and we've even heard speculation that they this has been the case of the Tunisian Coast Guard doing this even to Tunisians who are trying to migrate to Tunisia uh, to, to to Europe. Excuse me. Uh, so in, in I believe it was uh, last September. There was a boat that uh, left from Zarzis where there was even uh, 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 children on board mm -hmm. and who died, and then and then the bodies were found by authorities and they were buried in secret. Um, and they didn't tell the families, which led to quite a lot of speculation that, in fact, the Tunisian Coast Guard uh, uh, may have been uh, had a role in the sinking of that ship. Uh, and there was extreme anger at that time. That was one of the the the, the biggest sort of uh, protests we've seen uh, against uh, President Kai Saied uh, 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 since uh, his uh, centralization and taking up all full powers just a couple of years ago. Um, but you know, there was there was attempts even as early as 2016, 2017. Uh, by the EU to 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 have Tunisia be a uh, a center for processing uh, migrants uh, for processing uh, asylum seekers. Excuse me, on Tunisian territory. Uh, at the time, uh, the Prime Minister then uh, Yusuf Shehed had said that they, uh, they would not be uh, Europe's uh, uh, border guards. Um, yet, we've seen uh, uh, increasing funding both uh, on a multilateral basis from the EU uh, over the last couple of years, and not just the, uh, the the funding you mentioned that was promised in June, but even before that, there was annual funding through through this special uh, uh, EU. Uh, I think it's called the uh, um, Africa Emergency Fund uh, for controlling migration domestically. We've also seen bilateral funding coming from 
from the Italians uh, for 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 Tunisia's uh, uh, coast guard and beefing that up and and basically playing the same role that Frontex, the European border guard, uh, maritime border guard uh, agency, is doing, uh, but on Tunisian uh, uh, coasts. Uh, now, the, the latest news we've heard is that because of sort of the, the, the crisis uh, on the border uh, with Libya, um, there has been uh, uh, reports of, of some of them being repatriated uh, to Tunisian towns near the border. Uh, and if that's the case, that's 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 good news because these people were really in desperate situation. Not only were they saying that they had been the, the, the victims of violence by, by Tunisian authorities uh, who had uh, transported them there, but they were also lacking uh, water in, in extremely uh, high heat temperatures uh, uh, during this time of the year. Right. Uh, Father, also finally, just to look at uh, in terms of how Tunisian civil society, how organizations have responded, what do they sort of put, uh, what kind of demands are they presenting or what is the kind of agenda that is being put forward to actually deal with what is clearly a complicated issue, an issue that has come up in many countries and is being used by the right across to sort of polarize and divide society. Yeah, un unfortunately, we've seen some of the um, the representatives of UN agencies who are responsible for North Africa and Tunisia uh, are parroting some of the, the, the right wing uh, discourse of European politicians where they're saying, in fact, that these, these people should not be um, uh, uh, leaving their countries on the way to, to, to Europe. Uh, that the, the, if it, uh, some of them may be uh, seeking only economic um, uh, benefits and not necessarily escaping from 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 war. Of course, you know, uh, 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 the freedom of movement is something that's enshrined in UN principles. So it's it's very strange to see UN officials uh, using this discourse rather than uh, uh, really standing up for the for the for the right to free movement as enshrined in in, in, in many uh, principles. So that's been unfortunate, and and we've also seen that reflected in the policy. I mean, there they were the, it, it, we've seen that the IOM office uh, uh, report that they had actually asked Tunisian authorities to clear uh, migrants who were camping out in front of their offices in Tunis. Uh, so rather than help, helping them, they're actually saying that these are a nuisance uh, uh, for, for having camped out in front of their offices. So, so really, like I said earlier, like this, this seems to be that they've, they've, they've been abandoned by, by everyone, uh, not just the Tunisian authorities, uh, but also international authorities. Now, there have been some attempts by excuse me, Tunisian civil society to, 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 to help. Um, you know, they, they, they were not able to, to go to the border zone. They were saying that, you know, this is a military zone that the uh, Tunisian military controls. Uh, however, other people were also saying maybe they needed to make a, a stronger effort to, 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 to challenge that as well. Uh, you know, that said, uh, uh, there, there, there are limits to what uh, uh, Tunisian civil society organizations can do, especially when they're facing the threat of also facing prosecution from Tunisian authorities who are saying that uh, these migrants have no place in the country and anyone who helps them is also going to be subject to prosecution. Thank you so much, Fadil, for speaking to us, to give a, for giving us a very, I think, comprehensive update on a very troubled, uh, troubling situation. And I think really the Tunisian authorities, uh, like you said, have quite a lot to answer for in this situation. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And that's all we have time for today. We'll be returning to similar issues in future videos and episodes of People's Dispatch. Do keep watching.